Good morning and welcome to the Infant Family Mental Health Concepts and Considerations webinar with Dr. James McHale. Just a few housekeeping, this is Jennifer Evans and Kathleen Roberts with the Department of Children and Families Project Launch Initiative and we're hosting this event so we're going to do just a few housekeeping before we introduce Dr. McHale and his colleague. Just at the beginning, um, if you have any questions, you can use the raise your hand button and I'll be able to help you with any technical assistance that you may have. Um, we do encourage asking questions um, using the chat feature um, as you are coming up with them, as the presentation is going, and what we'll do is we'll be collecting those questions and asking them at the very end. If you are wanting to view this webinar in a full screen mode, what you can do is just click up at the very top um, of the screen and it says full screen. Um, and that will allow you to see it as an entire pre presentation without the video feature or the chat features. And if you go and click on full screen again, you'll be able to then um, be able to enter and chat, which was right here at the bottom of the screen. If you see the red arrow, um, you'll see that you can, at the bottom, chat and click enter and be able to ask any questions that you have throughout the podcast. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. James McHale. He is the president of the Florida Association for Infant Mental Health and chair of the Department of Psychology at University of South Florida, St. Petersburg. His research program examines the role of co-parenting and family group dynamics in families of infants, toddlers, and preschool aged children. He also maintains active interest in infant mental health, community psychology, family diversity, and primary prevention. Welcome, Dr. McHale. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, this is a, a terrific opportunity to, to, to talk with lots of different folks about infant mental health, and I, I appreciate the, the invitation. Um, our uh, presentation today uh, is going to focus on some basics of infant mental health. I know that uh, many folks who are involved with the LAUNCH project are going to be working with higher risk infants. Uh, some of the uh, children in your uh, care will be children um, who have not spent any time with their families who may have uh, entered into kinship or non-kinship foster care uh, right from the time of their birth. Um, others will be um, uh, on the call will be people who are caring for these infants. Uh, we have family members on the line. We have uh, foster parents on the line. So we've got quite a diverse audience today, and I'm very grateful to be able to present this information to all of you. Um, I had a very, very long um, presentation uh, initially planned, and because our time is relatively limited today, I uh, had to make some choices about what to, uh, what to start with. Uh, on our webinar. And so uh, this is the outline of what we'll cover today. Um, this uh, material is drawn from a program we have at USF St. Petersburg uh, called the Infant Family Mental Health Certificate Program. This is a uh, training program that we developed for people who will be going out to work in uh, systems of care uh, that serve infants and toddlers and their families. And uh, these are some of the basic core principles that we I uh, think are very important for anyone working with children and families to understand and understand well before they uh, they do their work. Infant mental health is a relatively um, new field. Uh, it's, it's been around in one form or another for a great many years, um, but as an integrated field, we're you know in our first couple of decades, and um, uh, the term mental uh, has very negative connotations for a lot of people. And when you put mental together with infant, a lot of people have very negative reactions to that. So what we're going to be talking about today is really um, as basic as healthy social and emotional development for infants, the kinds of things that every infant needs, uh, the kinds of things that promote healthy development, and then we'll talk about uh, what can get in the way for higher risk children, children who may uh, start their lives um, uh, in environments that don't provide the optimal level of support and care, and how we can work to get those kids back on track. Um, so this will be our outline, basics of healthy development, particularly during infancy. Um, I had initially planned to talk about the toddler years today as well. I'll say a few words about that, and uh, my colleague Lisa Negrini, who will be on a bit later, um, we'll have some case studies with uh, somewhat older children uh, for us to talk about uh, in the toddler years. Uh, but I'm going to focus, focus principally today on the first year, first 18 months of the child's life, because 
um, that's the cornerstone for everything that follows. And it's very, very important to understand what we ought to be doing for all children during this uh, uh, first 18 months to give them um, a, a firm foundation and a fighting chance. Um, after we talk about some of the basics, and I'm going to focus largely on attachment um, relationships during that first part of the presentation, we'll talk about what some of the problems are um, when things don't go as they should and what some of the um, consequences are both in the short term and then also uh, in the longer term. We know that uh, problems very early on in life um, have uh, significant long-term consequences and the greater the number of adverse experiences for the infant, um, the more substantial those long-term consequences are going to be. Um, following that, I'm going to do what I think is unique about this seminar and about the work that we do at the Family Study Center at USF St. Petersburg, and that's to talk about the notion of co-parenting as a, a system of support for all infants. Um, initially, I'll talk about uh, the notion of co-parenting, what it is, and why I think it's the key to, um, to doing successful work with the children um, who we'll be uh, seeing and working with as part of the launch project. Um, and, uh, and then I'll have uh, a few um, slides that provide some information about um, advice about co-parenting specifically for children who may be in the child welfare system. And then finally, um, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Lisa Negrini, who's put together a couple of case examples for you to um, illustrate and exemplify some of the principles we'll be talking about over the next period. All right, so uh, let's get started. Uh, this is the... Um, uh, broader slide that I put together when I was very ambitious about what we might cover over the next uh, 90 minutes or so, um, but we'll actually um, be uh, focused principally on the first uh, of these three bullet points. But let's just go ahead and um, uh, remind ourselves that what we're trying to do for all infants uh, during that first year of life is three basic things. Um, we're trying to work to help the infant to feel safe in the world, to feel uh, secure, supported, uh, confident, and, um, uh, and not afraid. Um, this, is, this is the root, the key of all else. If the child cannot feel safe and secure, um, most of her psychic energy is going to be tied up in just trying to make sure that she stays alive, survives, is able to defend herself against whatever challenges and chaos the environment might prevent, uh, present to her. So the goal is really to not have to have infants worry about those things, to be able to feel completely uh, cared for, loved, supported, secure, so she can be turning her psychic resources or psychological resources to the things that she ought to be spending time on. Um, as infants feel safe, they learn to develop relationships with other people, um, initially principally their primary caregivers, um, and, and I'm using uh, caregivers in the plural. Um, one of the themes for today is that infants develop multiple relationships. There's um, often in families uh, somebody who does the majority of the caregiving work um, in many families, that will be the child's mother. Um, in some families, it might be the child's father, grandmother, and so forth. But there's usually one primary caregiver. But most infant mental health thinking and theorizing stops there and doesn't come to recognize that the baby is actually developing multiple bonds with multiple people. So we're thinking multiple people today as we talk, a primary caregiver and others who the infant is also attached to. So they're not just supports or helps or extra folks out there. They're people with whom the baby forms a heart connection. Um, the primary relationships that the baby develops with these people allows them to learn. It's possible to connect with other people, be understood by other people, share emotions with other people, and understand the psychological worlds of other people. This is what we want our children to be able to do, right? We want them to be able to communicate successfully. We want them to feel seen, heard, understood. And we want them to be able to form positive and healthy relationships with others, um, especially other children as they, as they grow and leave the family and move into the uh, daycare and preschool settings. And then finally, the third basic uh, accomplishment during that first year of life, which is so critical to everything else later in life, is to be able to soothe oneself, to calm down um, when stress occurs. Initially, no infant can do this alone. All infants need to be helped to do this by the people who take care of them. Um, but gradually, as the child begins to age, they begin to learn some self-soothing strategies. They begin, uh, begin to um, show the capacity to soothe themselves, to quiet themselves, to distract themselves, to do things to regulate their own emotions. So this is a process that moves from other regulation, um, regulation um, that takes place um, from the adult to the infant during the first um, several months of life to a process where the baby has learned some strategies to be able to calm herself down. You, know, you and I had to calm ourselves down when we sat down at our computers this morning. We learned to do this. We um, 
Some of us do it better than others. Some of us do it worse than others. But we all develop this capacity. And the roots are during that first year of life. And the roots come from the relationships that have formed and developed. And I hope those three points make good sense to you because that's the core and the root of everything else we're going to talk about today and the core and the root of all the work of the launch project. This is what needs to happen for every infant. And when things go well, these things have been accomplished during the child's first year of life. When things don't go well, as we'll see, um, it takes longer for these things to occur. And for some children, it may never occur in the way that it needs to. And there can be uh, significant long-term consequences. So we've got a lot of work to do wrapping ourselves around um, the children who are going to be in our care in this project. Um, and around all children, of course. Um, years two and three, which we won't focus on a lot today, are also important to comment on right here at the start. Um, once the infant has developed a sense of safety and security in the world to the extent that she has, she then uses those relationships as her base of operations. And she uh, begins to explore uh, the world around her, to wander off. Um, while she's enamored with face-to-face -face interactions during the first several months of her life, she begins to turn her attention to uh, the world of objects and toys at around uh, usually somewhere between six and ten months of age, around eight months of age. Uh, most infants who are on track are very, very interested in toys and objects and exploration and uh, may even uh, focus um, on those kinds of things rather than on the adults around them. And, and for an extended period of time, um, they become avid uh, scientists, explorers who are out and about and learning about what the world has to offer. This is a good, this is a good thing. This is what we want for all of our children. This signifies that development is proceeding well and the child's on um, on a good course. Um, as the child um, explores successfully, as the child communicates her signals and is heard, um, as the child learns that uh, she's able to signal and have other people understand that she's able to manipulate things and um, extract really interesting information about them, she begins to feel like a very powerful person. Uh, she is an author of her experience. She is out there in the world making things happen for herself. Um, and this is just what we want. This is a child who eventually is going to be very, very school ready because she is feeling as though she is the master of her destiny. Um, and that didn't happen by chance. That happened because she was given security um, and a foundation during that first year of life. Um, the other thing is that the relationship network is expanding. So where it might have been just mom and dad or mom and grandma or uh, foster parents or um, uh, people in the extended kinship network during the first year, family members. Um, now the child is meeting other people. Uh, she's learning how to um, uh, become part of their world and, and invite them to become part of hers. Um, con conflicts begin to arise. It's a little challenging for uh, kids during their second year of life to successfully navigate those challenges. So that's something that really is going to begin developing during year two and, and um, become better during year three. And, Adults need to help initially with those initial challenges, but children become better and better at being able to expand their social world, invite others in, and become a, a part of a, a collective. In year three, um, from 24 to 36 months, now you've got the child who is really ready for inquiry. Um, many um, uh, programs that children enter, daycare programs, out-of-home uh, out care programs, will have curricula that will provide enrichment activities and opportunities for little kids. Um, uh, people often say babies uh, are like a sponge during this period. They're, they're picking up everything. Um, some, uh, some children who are exposed to environments with our multiple languages will pick up multiple languages during this period of time. And um, the, the better the first 24 months have gone, the more the children are going to be able to just immerse themselves in this environment and be inquiring and, um, uh, and learning in the ways that um, all children are capable of learning. But it's only to the extent that the foundation has been laid and laid well during the first two years of life. If the children are spending a lot of their time and psychological energy on safety issues, on being able to try to communicate and being unsuccessful in doing that, they're going to be devoting their time and attention to these earlier issues that um, ideally would have already been successfully resolved and the child will have moved on. So um, it's sort of like stair steps. One thing needs to happen before the next can occur successfully. And if those things haven't happened, we need to go back and help make them happen to get the child back on track. Um, effortful control, being able to self-regulate, calm down, delay gratification, wait, 
uh, follow rules, all of those kinds of things um, kids are um, practicing and becoming better at during their third year. Of course, even very young infants have to practice some control, but the effortful control relies on a certain level of brain development that really will have begun to come to fruition during the child's third year. Um, and as I mentioned previously, um, uh, there will be relationship con conflicts um, galore during the child's third year as she's uh, interacting with other children her age and she'll become better and better at resolving these kinds of things. To the extent that all of these things happen and happen well during the third year, she's going to be ready to learn. She's going to be ready to enter into that preschool classroom. We've got a child who's poised to take on the world. Um, so we're going to now shift back and we're going to focus principally on the first year and on attachment relationships for the next little bit in our presentation here. Um, but you know, hopefully get a chance to visit with you all again in the future and we'll be able to spend some time on older toddlers and, and some of the points that I spoke about in the second two bullets here. All right, let's move on. Um, the first 12 months of life, um, I mentioned what the key uh, goals and accomplishments are for those first 12 months. All of those will um, uh, blossom to the extent that the child has developed positive and secure attachments um, with others in their environment. I mentioned to you that there is often a primary caregiver in family systems. Um, this uh, individual uh, traditionally and historically was always thought of as a child's mother and in uh, millions of families that's still the case. Mom is providing the, the primary care. Um, but in um, some families, that care is shared between mom and dad, between mom and grandma. And for some of the children who will be uh, working with us in our launch project, those will be children whose moms may have had some challenges and difficulties during the pregnancy. Um, substances may have been involved. Uh, some of those children may have gone home, but some of them will have entered directly into foster care, either with grandparents or other uh, fictive or blood kin, um, or with uh, non-kin foster parents who are going to be caring for them during their first year of life. Regardless of who the important adults are um, spending time with that infant during those first 12 months, the, um, the baby is going to be looking to develop um, a secure and trusting attachment with those people who are part of her day-to-day -day life. Without developing um, a trusting attachment with that individual, those individuals, let's be thinking plural, um, the baby is not going to feel safe. Uh, she's going to feel like she doesn't know um, what's going to happen next. She's waiting for the shoe to drop. She's not sure who can be trusted, who will be able to be there for her when she needs them. Um, it's going to be very difficult for her to be able to develop um, uh, um, connections with others because there's not a consistent responsive environment for her to begin to learn that others can see you, hear you, understand you, read you. Um, and so the signals that she sends won't be reliably met. And this is going to make it very difficult for her to begin to move to a place where she can calm herself down and soothe herself when she's distressed. So we need to, as quickly as possible, begin putting some of these elements in place. Attachment theory was introduced by uh, John Bowlby um, uh, back in the 1950s. And um, the, the core notion, the core metaphor um, for attachment theory is that the infant needs to feel that she has um, a secure base from which to operate in the world. I love this photo. It's one of my favorite photos um, that shows um, what level of trust is necessary in order for the child to really be able to, um, to feel that connection, that bond. And um, nobody's going to take that leap um, unless they really feel like there's some waiting arms there to catch them. And that's not something that develops overnight. Um, that takes quite some time to develop, and the baby's not going to be um, taking those steps to, um, to leave the secure base and see what else is out in the world until she's absolutely certain that her safety has been assured by the people who are taking care of her. Bowlby talked about a concept he called an attachment exploration balance. And this is, <clears throat> this is what I've been saying so far. Until such a time as the baby feels absolutely certain and confident that that adult caregiver or set of caregivers will always be there um, when she comes back and seeks them and needs them, um, she's not going to be wandering far off to explore the environment and see what the world has to offer because it's not going to be safe. If she feels as though she may wander away from the, uh, the parents who are a secure base, and by wander away, I don't mean in the mall or in a crowded airport. I mean in her house, at home, um, in her environment in which she's growing up day to day. Um, the child is going to be less likely to um, step away, uh, explore avidly, learn about the world, do the kinds of things that we want our children to be doing um, uh, toward the end of their first year of life, unless they feel safety and security. If the uh, adults in their life have not been responding contingently, sensitively, responsively to them, and we'll talk about what that means in just a couple moments, um, the child is going to 
be feeling afraid, anxious, um, not certain, and she's going to stay closer to home. She's going to be spending a lot of her time monitoring, making sure the adults are around, um, kind of self-contained, and um, you know, sort of uh, metaphorically at the feet of her caregivers. Um, and that, again, remember we're talking about infants during the first year of their life, infants who are not yet mobile, infants who are just beginning to become mobile. Um, and so um, they too can feel safe and secure or um, unsafe and insecure. And so the goal is to try to provide that sense of safety so they can be turning their psychological energies elsewhere. Um, a secure base is what allows the child to explore the world. And this is true not just for infants during the first year. This is true for children as they get older, children who are showing greater separation anxiety, have more fear that if they leave their home base, the, the home base may dissipate and not be there when they come back again. So um, to the extent that we're able to provide um, uh, wraparound safety and security for kids early on, we're going to be maximizing the likelihood that they're going to be able to take advantage of um, what the world has to offer. Secure attachments were um, identified in some research by Mary Ainsworth back in the 1960s. Um, she developed a very creative paradigm where she had um, uh, the adults who were responsible for children's care step away from them for a few moments while they were in the care of Ainsworth and her colleagues. Um, they would be in a playroom with Ainsworth and her colleagues. Um, uh, they would get acquainted for a bit. Um, mom would be called away for just a few moments to step out of the room and she would leave the child alone. Most infants, as you might imagine, became distressed when um, mothers were away from them in this strange situation. Um, but it wasn't the level of distress that the infant um, uh, exhibited that was most telling. What was most telling was the way that the mother uh, and infant reunited with one another. How did the infant react when mom came back in the room again after this brief separation? Um, for most of the infants in um, the project that Ainsworth did, when uh, care records returned, the infants did what you might expect that they would do. They immediately made a beeline toward her, asked to be picked up, um, uh, nestled in, cuddled in, um, quieted down if they had been distressed, and just kind of got a dose of security from mom. They sort of were delighted to have mom back again. They used her to calm themselves down, to, to re-regulate, to feel um, safe and secure. And then once they had gotten that sense, okay, mom's back, the world's okay again now, I'm safe, then they would go back off and explore again for a little while. So um, uh, under the stressful time, the immediate knee-jerk reaction of these kids was to seek out the parent, to, to, to go and ask the parent to comfort and calm them down. They'd come to expect, to anticipate that the mother was able to provide that for them through many, many, many experiences over the course of the first year, and they were able to use her to help re-regulate themselves. That's our goal. That's our ideal. That's a secure attachment. Um, what was very interesting uh, was that um, uh, there was some variability among the children in uh, the extent to which they uh, needed comfort from moms. Some of the uh, secure children um, needed to kind of go and cling and hold on for a period of time and didn't want to be put down and they needed just that bodily contact and a, a little bit more time to feel safe. Some of the kids were able to greet moms, you know, maybe just go over and say a quick hi, pat her on the leg. Some of them even greet her from a distance, smile, make eye contact, reconnect, and then go back to playing. But they were using mom, you know, to kind of re-regulate themselves. So there's some variability in secure infants in the extent to which they needed that physical contact, extended contact. But the key is that all of them were able to use her to calm themselves down, soothe themselves, feel safe and secure again, and then wander back off into the world um, um, having um, reconnected with mom. We know from Ainsworth's research that the um, secure attachments developed because of um, repeated over and over and over again during the first year of life um, uh, episodes where mom was interacting with the child, providing a sensitive and contingent responsiveness. Um, Ainsworth visited families, so when moms would be feeding the babies, when Ainsworth and her colleagues were in the house, they'd be feeding them, and if the baby didn't like the, the spinach that she was eating, mom would sneak in a few peaches, and then baby would eat the peaches, and then mom would get some of the other food back in again, so the baby was getting all the nutrients and nutrition that, that she needed during feedings. Um, once the baby had moved, of course, to, um, to um, you know, from uh, just breast milk to um, actually having some other kinds of food. When the babies would cry, mothers would respond, uh, figure out what it was that the babies needed. Not perfectly, not all of the time. No parent does that. But by and large, the kid would learn that when she signaled, mom would come and mom would figure out what her need was and that this was a routine that they got into. So. Um, children learned that their signals meant something, that their signals would be responded to, and that was what allowed them to feel powerful and to feel secure. 
Um, now, the face-to-face -face interactions that um, took place um, were critically important. And at the time that Ainsworth was doing her research, she was focusing more on the global interaction patterns. But we've come to learn subsequently that it's the moment-to-moment, face-to-face, eye-to-eye uh, interactions that take place every single day that are really the stuff of which attachments are made. And so at the very bottom of this slide, you'll see that I've got the um, uh, the, the term serve and return responses. And this is so uh, critical to um, observe and to understand. When we're working with families, we're looking for um, attunement between caregivers and infants during face-to-face -face interactions. We're looking for dyads um, who have come to know one another, who have come to learn what to expect. And that is shared during these serve and return responses. So this is what a serve and return response looks like. This is taken from uh, one of the marvelous publications from the uh, Center for the Developing Child at Harvard University. Virtually all of the materials that I'm sharing with you today can be um, accessed from some of the technical reports that they put out and that are accessible online through their website. Um, the particular um, publication that this one is from is noted at the bottom of this slide. But essentially, serve and return. This is a tennis metaphor, right? So the baby is signaling something. The parent is waiting for it. The parent gives the baby back what the baby is looking for. The baby receives this back, feels seen and understood, recommunicates. The adult receives this, figures out what the baby is saying, and communicates back again. We do this unthinkingly. We do this intuitively. But this is the stuff that allows the baby to feel as though she can be seen heard and understood. These are routine interactions that need to take place every day and that do in families where children develop secure attachments. The attunement that develops between the uh, infant and the parent affects the infant's brain development. This is a, an incredibly important discovery over the last 15-20 um, years in our field. And you know, there was a time when we talked about um, infants who were having some struggles during the second and third year of their life is having developed bad habits. They had learned bad traits. There were some things that they needed to unlearn so that they could be more effective. And we now understand that all of children's behavior during the first, second, third year of life is adaptive. It's all intended to deal with the fate that they've been dealt, the cards they've been dealt, the environment that they're living in. Um, but as children develop and as they learn to adapt to different kinds of environments, what's happening is on a moment-to-moment, -moment, day day-to-day basis, their brains are being shaped. Connections are being made in their brain. They're going to serve the foundation to last them a lifetime. And the attunement, if you look at the, the picture in the lower left screen here, the attunement between a parent and caregiver during interactions is actually shaping the infant's brain development. Um, you know, I, I teach... Um, a course in intro psychology. I'm going to uh, begin teaching a new online course just next week for freshmen at USF St. Petersburg. We talk about three areas of the brain, a central core, which is present and functional from the very first day of life, which helps the child to survive, heartbeat, uh, respiration, uh, consciousness, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, falling asleep, waking up, gagging up milk uh, if you're choking. All those things are hardwired in a full-term infant. That set of activities is fully functional on day one. But then during the first 18 to 30 months of the baby's life develops the middle part of the brain called the limbic system. This part of the brain is exquisitely responsive to experience. And as you look at that picture in the lower left corner, this limbic area of the brain is part of what's being um, wired during the first 18 months, along with some beginning development of the top part of the brain called the cortex, which is what we all think of when we think of the brain. The cortex is the last part of the brain to develop, and it doesn't finish developing until the person's about 20, you know, 20, 21 years old. So that part of the brain continues to develop, but the limbic system, which is the seat of all of our emotions, all of our stress response regulation, systems and all of the really important connections that help us to figure out how we should react and respond when there's been some kind of an environmental stressor. That's being wired during the first 18 to 30 months of the child's life, literally being wired as an electrician would wire your house. And the wiring is being shaped by those face-to-face -face interactions that you see in the lower left corner right there. So this attunement is so critically important to healthy brain development. Um, and imagine what happens if that attunement is not occurring every day. Um, the kind of brain wiring that occurs is going to be very, very different. So um, what I've said to you so far is that attunement is critical for later emotional self-regulation. The babies who don't experience attunement have difficulty forming 
healthy attachments. They are not learning that the environment is going to be responsive. And without these attachments, it becomes very difficult for the babies to self-soothe and self-regulate. When something happens in the environment that stresses them, they're not developing expectations that there's going to be a quick and clear and decisive response from caregivers who are going to help them to feel better. Um, sometimes there is, sometimes there's not. And when there's not, that's scary. That's very frightening to a small infant. And it becomes very difficult for infants to manage stress themselves. And so they begin showing some difficulties in um, emotional regulation. Um, and those are emotion regulation abilities that are believed to be located in the right prefrontal cortex. Um, that was the area of the brain highlighted on the prior slide during the attunement interaction. What uh, adults can do to promote um, secure attachments um, are uh, very, very basic things that, that many families know, but that other families need to come to know, um, either through experience or through coaching and support and help. Um, the most important thing, um, hopefully, you've gotten from what I've said so far, to show attentive, responsive, and loving caregiving. Um, consistency is, is a real key. As I said, nobody can be consistent 100% of the time when a baby's crying. The microwave's going off, the phone's ringing, something's on the stove, another child is demanding attention. But basically, being accessible, responding quickly to distress, and figuring out what it is that the child needs, this um, every day, face-to-face um, -face eye contact, smiling and looking at the baby. We know that the use of touch is so critically important. You know, there was a time I know when many foster parents were concerned about developing a close-up secure attachment and bond with an infant who they knew would be leaving their care later on. So they would provide all of the perfunctory care that's necessary, the changing, the diapering, the feeding, some, you know, some time together smiling and talking, but not as much of the close-up tactile comfort, which is so critically important to helping babies develop a sense of self-regulation. All of these things, rocking, cuddling, holding for comfort, babies need these. And whomever is responsible for baby's care needs to provide those. Verbal stimulation, there, you know, countless thousands of diaper changes during the baby's first several years of life. Every one of them is an opportunity to make eye contact, to talk with the baby, to sing with the baby. Every diaper change where those things don't happen, every feeding where those things don't happen is a missed opportunity. Those kinds of things are very, very important for promoting healthy emotional development and healthy brain development. Um, as children get older and become um, ready to start using their bodies floor time, um, giving children an opportunity to be on the floor one-on-one -on -one with you 20 minutes at a time every single day. Really important. And during that time, it's not time to teach the baby. It's time to kind of read the baby, let the baby tell you what she thinks is cool and important, and being able to follow the baby's signals during that unencumbered time. Floor time, when we talk about floor time, we talk about time that's the baby's time. It's infant-directed play. You're not telling the baby what to do. You're not telling and teaching. You're going to be doing that through the rest of the day. This is the baby's time to signal to you and to draw you into her world. Um, there are some uh, programs that help parents to do this. Watch, Wait, and Wonder, um, uh, Greenspan's Floor Time. Um, in St. Petersburg recently, we had uh, some folks from California come out, um, the RIE group researchers for infant educators who worked on uh, floor time uh, and face-to-face uh, -face play principles with many of the folks in our um, system of care for infants and toddlers in Pinellas County. Um, so many models, but all of them are common uh, in sharing uh, the infant-directed play. Um, uh, predictable Routines. Predictable is the key word in all that we're talking about. The baby needs to come to expect. When I was um, younger, um, I uh, sat for um, a niece when she was, I don't even remember how old she was, maybe 12 months old, 13 months old, uh, spent an overnight there and got very clear directions on what to do in the morning. You know, first you do the diaper change, and then you do the bottle and so forth. You know, this is what she's going to expect. And of course, knucklehead youngster that I was, I bought the bottle in before the diaper change, and the baby just threw a fit. And, and, was trying it with every ounce of her being to communicate that something was wrong. She expected the diaper change first that didn't come, and it just disorganized her and threw her off. Those predictable routines so critically important in helping to give that infant some self-regulation. Um, songs that the baby comes to know, games that they come to know, all of these things are very important. And if the child has developed some of those routines in their biological family and then goes to stay with a foster family, all of these things need to be communicated to the foster family so they can provide some stability and security to the baby in providing some things that are known and knowable that will allow the baby to self-regulate. We're not just starting from scratch and from a blank slate again. I'll say a little bit more about that shortly. And then the notion about boundaries and a sense of safety. You know, uh, this is very, very important. But so many people come in and they say, I'm here to learn about how to handle my child's 
bad behavior. They're very willful. They're you know a handful to deal with. We're here about the behavior, and we need to back all of it up and think about whether some of these foundational things are there first before we start talking about ways to um, um, you know provide discipline and so forth for uh, for older toddlers. Um, again, we're not going to be talking much about toddlers. This slide is really talking about um, you know, things that you can do when children are a little bit out of control. Um, the one th uh, message I want to leave you with in this relatively brief webinar we have today um, is help the baby with the emotions. You know, it's not timing them out when they're having emotions. It's staying in place, accepting the emotions. The baby's trying to communicate with you. Emotions are communication. They need something. Um, talking to her about what's going on. Um, any of those behaviors that are listed on there, clinging, becoming mum, uh, showing out of control emotions, the baby is saying, I'm feeling overwhelmed, I need help. And that's when the parent really, really needs to be there. It's not a time to sort of put the baby in the room until she stops crying. That's how the baby is going to learn basic trust. And as children get older, you can start labeling the feelings, talking about them, naming them, and helping to put words to those. So a summary of what I've said so far about secure attachments, I'm going to spend about um, 10 12 minutes on insecure attachments in just a moment. Um, these develop when caregivers are providing consistent and sensitive responses. They're helping to promote healthy brain development. They're helping the child to develop self-regulation and control. Once babies have learned these things, they now have the skills that they then use in other relationships. And children do what they've learned to do. Um, so here you've got a child who has developed a secure attachment, who knows about love, caring, security, who is trying to help a smaller child during a time when she needs that kind of help. Things have gone right for the child on the right, and uh, uh, he's able to use what he learned in other settings. When a baby develops an insecure attachment, um, the problems can occur. Not every child's environment allows them to develop these secure attachments, but because a secure attachment doesn't develop doesn't mean the child doesn't have an attachment. She does, but it's a different kind of an attachment. Um, typically, we talk about these as anxious or insecure attachments. Um, they are adaptive attachments. They help the baby to feel like she can survive in the environment that she's in, but they're not quite so adaptive in the longer run. Um, the first kind of anxious attachment is called an avoidant attachment. We see so many avoidant attachments in the children who are growing up in high stress and chaotic environments. In these environments, caregivers are typically not sensitively responsive, and babies get the message when they signal something, I don't have time for you right now. You just need to deal with that on your own. Take care of stuff. These are not rejecting parents in the sense that they neglect the infants, don't feed them, don't take care of them, but they may do so in a very perfunctory way. Um, you know, Baby's basic needs are being met. Parent is preoccupied doing other things. Baby's signaling that she needs some one-on-one -on -one FaceTime, some serve and volley time and is not getting that from parents. So each time the baby signals, she's kind of getting pushed away. Mom is feeding, the baby doesn't want the spinach instead of sneaking some spinach. Um, if baby spits out the spinach, it's like, okay, okay, you're done. We're finished feeding and sort of mini rejection. So mom wraps things up, moves on, does something else. She's taking care of baby, but in this sort of hands-off way. Um, and babies can learn that. So babies stop making demands on the parents. They develop what's called an avoidant attachment. They just kind of do their own thing. If you see them in a strange situation for Ainsworth, mom separates, mom comes back in the room, infants notice that they're there, but they just keep doing what they're doing. They don't seek the comfort and security because they know that that's not really what mom is encouraging from them. So these babies are great, right? They're mature, they're independent, they're autonomous. Well, not really. So that baby who's just kind of playing and not seeking out the caregiver under times of stress, if you monitor her heart rate, it's beating like you wouldn't believe. That baby is incredibly stressed out, but she's keeping everything self-contained and she's not asking for help. Why is this an attachment? Well, the baby is keeping mom close by not putting demands on her and learns that's not what mom wants. So if mom's going to stay around and be looking after me, I need to give her what she wants. So it's a strategy. It's an avoidance strategy, but presumably if something really bad happened, if some stranger, some really bad person came in the room, mom's close enough that she would step in and protect me and take care of me if I really needed it under that dire circumstance. So it's a strategy, uh, but it's an avoidance strategy. It keeps the baby close, but it's not especially adaptive. As those kids get older, when they're put in problem-solving tasks, where they need help to solve it, they don't ask for help. They try maladaptively to persevere on their own, and it doesn't work. So the strategy, which was initially adaptive in this relationship with the caregiver, is less adaptive later on when kids don't ask for help, when they might actually need help. Um, another strategy is called an anxious, oh, uh, I'm sorry, this is the second 
uh, slide of the anxious avoidance strategy, and then I'll move on to strategy two. Um, uh, this is what I mentioned to you, that the baby's heart rate is high, even when she seems like she's handling stuff on her own. Um, uh, the child looking away here is kind of a signal that the child is not looking to the caregiver to comfort them. Even though the caregiver is providing some comfort here, the child is actually not you know, taking in what the caregiver is providing. And this is one of the signs that we don't have infants who are showing you the typical approach it does to the, the caregivers as um, secure infants might. The insecure, uh, anxious strategy, uh, anxious ambivalent, um, is a child who, um, when the caregiver leaves the room and comes back, um, the child throws a temper tantrum. They, show, they throw a fit. There's the caregiver right there, and all the child needs to go over and seek some comfort and security, but instead they amplify the responses, and they get very, very dramatic, and they lose control and self-regulation when the caregiver's back in again. Ainsworth traced that pattern back. It's a very, very odd pattern. Um, and what she discovered was in the first year of life for these children who would show this pattern, um, there was inconsistent responsiveness from parents. So sometimes parents would respond. Other times they would be preoccupied and not respond. Sometimes they would feel just really stressed out. And they would need the baby to comfort them. So they would pick up the baby and hold the baby and comfort the baby, and the baby hadn't signaled that she wanted any connection. So very, very inconsistent patterns of responding during the baby's first year. The baby never learned what to expect. And she felt kind of helpless that sometimes she'd signal be responded to, sometimes she signal wouldn't be responded to, sometimes she wouldn't signal and be responded to. And it was very, very frustrating for the infant not knowing when the responsiveness would be there. Very different from the avoidant infant who had learned that the environment was not going to respond, so I need to cope and deal with that. These kids felt very, very helpless. And so here's the caregiver back in the room, and so the baby throws this wild tantrum to signal no caregiver could possibly miss that. So this caregiver, too, will know I need her by my throwing this out of control display. But then the caregiver picks the baby up and the baby takes a swat at the parent, and shows some anger. And so the caregiver is like, whoa, okay, you don't want me, let me put you back down. But the baby squirms and wants to be picked back up. There's this ambivalent response and it has to do with difficulties in emotion regulation and it has to do with the baby feeling very helpless and unable to be seen and heard and read. Again, it's a strategy because by being wild and out of control, it draws the caregiver in, but not in the way that we would like to see. And it's a sign of what the relationship has been like up until that point in time. So um, in this particular strategy, which again, many children that will be working with this project will show, there is a lack of understanding that the world can be a consistent, responsive place and that you need to show bigger and bigger signals just to be seen and heard and understood. So we obviously need to provide some repair for that child as well. Most worrisome of all disorganized attachments, the absence of any adaptive strategy. Children who are abused are um, uh, the, the person who's supposed to be taking care of them and providing comfort is also the source of their alarm. So they can't develop a strategy as the avoidant or ambivalent children did. They freeze. They become disorganized. They can't go toward because going toward might mean that something bad will happen. And so there's not an adaptive strategy that these kids develop at all. Some of the worst long-term outcomes that we see um, are shown by children who um, develop disorganized attachments and many, many disorganized attachments of children in the child welfare system. These attachments don't come from nowhere. I told you that Ainsworth had documented that they came from patterns of caregiving behavior that were shown during the child's first year. We now know that the patterns of caregiving behavior came from the states of mind with respect to attachment of the um, parents who took care of those children. The adults came into the, um, uh, the, the job of being a parent with their own um, memories and recollections and ideas about what it meant to be in a relationship. Avoidant children, their parents were more likely to not see the importance of attachment. As children themselves, they may have been rejected. They distanced themselves from other people. They believe that, you know, to be strong, you know, you need to not rely on others. So they're trying to help their children to develop the sense of adjustment. Um, you know, so there may actually be some benevolent motivations behind it. The rejecting is not just, I don't like you, I don't want you, I wish you were never born. The rejection may actually be a pushing toward premature autonomy, but the kids are just not developmentally ready for that. And so what ends up happening is the parent recreates this avoidant attachment. Parents of um, uh, ambivalent infants, insecure ambivalent infants, often haven't resolved their own attachment issues early on. They are still very needy emotionally. They sometimes ask the infants to take care of them and meet their own emotional needs. Um, but they become preoccupied with other things. And so for periods of time, they're not available to the infant. 
Baby is just not getting that everyday serve and volley attuned interaction from those parents that they need because of the parent's preoccupation. Um, and so um, the, the secure infants, on the other hand, have parents who have been able to work through whatever relationship issues they may have had as children. It's not that they had you know, all goodness and light in their childhoods, but they've come to feel now that they're able to stand alone, feel separate, feel confident as adults, deal with their own relationship issues. They are now able to give security to their own children. And so what of the children who develop disorganized attachments? There we have some severe trauma that may have occurred early on in the life of the parent that was never resolved. And those trauma reminders come through and they sometimes frighten the child um, or the adult themselves may still be traumatized. The infant is able to read very early on what's happening with the adults caring for them and the adult's fear makes the child afraid. So the, the adult has some issues that really need uh, to be taken care of and helped with in order for them to be able to give security. Um, this slide I'm going to um, not spend a lot of time on, but essentially what we're trying to do as we work with families who may have had some of these dire histories is to move them from a working model of their child of being um, just out of control, this is this monster trying to control me, there's nothing I can do to help, to um, 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 I am able to understand this child when he's behaving like that, he's signaling that he needs me. He wants me to help him. I'm loved. I can give some concern and affection. I can help him. So the model that the parent has of their child needs to shift or change in order for them to be able to provide some of the sensitive care. So in many of the therapeutic interactions, this is the work that gets done to try to be helpful to parents to have a new model of their child. Again, remember I told you that almost all children are capable of forming multiple attachments to multiple caregivers. Um, this is critically important when we start talking about children who are moving away from their biological family and into their foster family. They will develop attachments with their foster parents, whether that's um, relatives or non-kinship caregivers. But if they had spent some time in their biological family, they will have begun developing attachments with those individuals that will be still there and still alive and will need to be kindled and nurtured. They will also develop attachments with the person who is their primary and principal um, care provider outside of the home. What's very important about this is that it is the quality of interactions, the quality of um, care that the child receives during the time they're with each of these individuals with whom they have heart connections and bonds that's most important. Quantity of time is necessary and if the person doesn't see an attachment figure for weeks, months on end, that attachment is going to dissipate and fade and if the child's old enough, they're going to mourn that attachment. So some quantity is necessary and as judges are making decisions about frequency of visitation, you need to make sure you're having as frequent visitations as possible, um, but it's really more what's happening during those interactions. Are they positive? Are they child-centered? To the extent that they are, um, good things are going to happen in that relationship. And that's a very important principle for us to remember. Babies are not going to form infinite numbers of attachments. They'll form two, three primary bonds, and those bonds are not interchangeable. This is kind of a, a point that we're going to um, focus on again um, in just a little bit when um, we start talking about kids in the child welfare system. Um, so a few words about stress. When things go bad, um, the level of stress um, uh, matters. Some stress is positive. Every child needs to learn that there are slings and arrows. You need to learn to deal with that. And the more children have a minor stressor, they cope, they deal with it, they're helped to deal with it. This actually is a good thing that helps to provide a stealing effect for them. Um, but as stress um, intensifies, it can be harder for the child and can be sometimes even traumatizing. And then when that stress never goes away, we talk about that as a toxic level of stress that has dire, dire consequences for the child. This is my daughter. Um, at uh, 16 months. When she was 16 months old, I had to go give a presentation in Australia. Um, uh, when I was in Australia, on the first day that I was there, I called home. I talked with her for a while on the phone. Um, and then um, when we hung up the phone, my wife told me that she cried for about a half an hour um, after we hung up the phone. The next day I called her, I was getting only one or two word answers from her. Um, she wasn't having the same dialogue she had with me the day before. My wife told me again, um, that after we hung up the phone, she again cried inconsolably for half an hour. The third day when I called home, she wouldn't get on the phone and talk with me. And I'm on the other side of the world. You can imagine how distressing this was. I just had to rush back home again. Got back home. You know, it took, you know, immediately had a reunion. Things were good. But it took a while for things to get back on an even keel. For a month, for an entire month, she woke up in the middle of the night screaming and crying hysterically. 
um, and had never done that before in her life. And we have to console her and take care of her. She was old enough we were able to talk with her a little bit about the stress. We talked with her about that in advance as it was happening afterwards. But it took an entire month before she stopped having these middle of the night awakenings. Still to this day, she shows a sensitivity to leave takings and stress that uh, my son, who was only three months old at the time I left, doesn't show because he hadn't yet come, become cognizant that I was an important figure in his life who is now gone. We're talking about a one week separation from a child who's very well supported by her family and the effects that that had for her in the shorter term is a very traumatizing experience for her. When these experiences recur and happen over and over again and they happen on a daily basis and the baby can't get back again, that becomes a level of toxic stress that um, has profound effects on the child's developing nervous system, on their brain and on their emotional development. Um, these are some of the things that are traumatizing. It's not just abuse that we're talking about. Um, um, inadequate caregiving, we talked about that in, in terms of children who are not able to get what they need, can have a powerful effect. Prolonged separation from parents, as often happens when children leave their family and move into foster care. Um, removal from an attachment figure is probably the greatest stressor that an infant can endure. We sometimes say, boy, that child's safe now. She's in a very bad home environment. Now we've got her in foster care. Now things are going better but not so much. Um, that child is grieving that loss. She's traumatized. She can't tell us. She doesn't have words yet. Um, witnessing violence in the home, chronic illness, all of these are stressors for infants. Trauma has toxic effects when it happens over and over and over again. And when children can't tell you what's going on with them, these are the infants and toddlers that we're caring for. These are the kids who are not able to um, uh, tell us that the stress is going on. We need to know that. We need to help them with that stress by pro providing repair experiences. So many American infants, as you can see on the slide, experience levels of toxic stress in the home from mistreatment, from parents uh, using substances and not being tuned to the children, um, from postpartum depression where the adults are not able to respond to the children's needs. Trauma can affect how the brain develops. The more the trauma, the greater the chronic stress, the more the baby's nervous system is being altered and changed for all time. Um, this is a slide um, from infants who were raised in um, out-of-home care in Romania. And what you see on the right are higher levels of uh, a hormone called cortisol circulating in that infant's everyday bloodstream. Um, cortisol is a hormone that's released under times of stress. Um, you and I release it when we're stressed out. But over time, the more that that hormone appears in our body, the more we're damaging the very system that turns that hormone off to the extent that our, we're walking around every day in higher levels of chronic stress. And we're changing the baby's body so that this is an everyday state for them. Now, this was a study that was initially done in Romania, but this is not just a finding um, that, was, um, that speaks to children growing up in Romania. Every child's social experiences are wiring their brain in a way that's going to last them a lifetime. I've used this picture in many presentations, some of which some of you have seen before. In Tampa, there was a highway construction where it took a very long time to make a very tiny, tiny deviation in the road system there. It took four years to make a relatively minor change. That's because the people who were trying to make that change were constrained by the original infrastructure that had been laid down by the city and regional planners. They wanted to make a small change, but it took a long time and a lot of effort. The baby's brain is the same way. Once you've wired it a certain way, can it change through reparative experiences? Sure, it can change with a tremendous amount of time and effort and energy to make relatively small changes. We can't be waiting until the child's three, four, five to do that. We have to be doing that as early on as possible. Um, all right, a couple last slides here before I turn it over to Lisa. Um, if trauma is not addressed, we see all kinds of symptoms. We see inconsolable crying. Um, we see um, amplified separation distress, um, ang anger that the child can't control. Um, uh, we can see some signs like head banging and um, um, some of the other um, uh, maladaptive soothing techniques that you see there, feeding problems, um, dissociation when the baby is just basically blanking and just kind of numbing and stepping away from the world. Um, and altered developmental trajectories, altered learning trajectories. These things are almost inevitable from early trauma. And in the worst case scenario, children will develop the disorder of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, um, where they're showing severe signs of um, um, avoidance, um, hyperarousal, hypervigilance, and inability to um, engage successfully with the world. Um, 
adults can help, but they can't do it alone. You need an infant mental health therapist on the case to be helping and working with the, um, the family in those situations. Um, babies who are ignored um, need people to step in and take care of them. Neglect, we now know, has an even more powerful organizing effect than does abuse. Um, neglect is a very, very traumatizing experience for infants and toddlers. And the goal of working with neglected children is to help them to learn that adults can be trusted, but it takes a very, very long time. Almost all children who have grown up in neglectful environments will be showing you some very severe problems um, along the lines of um, what are described on this slide. Some of the children will actually show you this sort of bizarre behavior where they'll go up to anybody and, and, and ask anybody to help them because they've been neglected any port in the storm, but it's very, very maladaptive. These are children who are putting themselves in harm's way through this strategy that they've developed over time. So again, stress and trauma, um, very, very disorganizing and can have powerful long-term effects, not just in the short run. These are lifetime effects that we're talking about um, as a result of negative early experiences. We need to step in and help when we can. Co-parenting is a key. Um, Co-parenting is everybody in the life of that child working together to try to help that child um, to regain um, positive footing and to move positively in life. So other people can come in and provide some of what the child may have been lacking, but it's not just enough for you to come in and be a savior and help that child. We also need to help and fix and repair some of the more negative relationships. It's a team effort. We're all involved in this together. And we study co-parenting at the Family Study Center at USS St. Pete. We study it in all kinds of family systems. And we study it principally in families who have infants and very small children. Um, our belief is that between birth and age 18, every child on the planet will be co-parented. Um, at some points in time, it's just mom on the case. You have just a single mom. But most of the children we're working for, with here in the launch project, there are going to be multiple people involved. It might be mom and grandma. It might be mom and dad. It might be mom and dad in the foster family for a period of time. The caregiver is involved. The child will develop an attachment with her. Um, all of these individuals need to be communicating effectively with one another in order to be able to provide the sense of stability and consistency that that baby is going to need. Communication is key. Attunement is key. But we create a system, unfortunately, where it's very, very difficult for that communication to take place, but it's critically important. Um, I've got just uh, a few slides remaining. Um, you're on in a minute or two, Lisa. Um, this wonderful publication um, um, uh, I, I ask all of you to get a hold of, co-parenting is a key to helping kids become reunified with their families um, if they have left home. Uh, in child welfare, it's so very important that we take stock of all the individuals who are going to be helping and working with that infant or toddler who may have been traumatized, may have been neglected, may have not gotten off to an early start, to be able to provide the kind of wraparound care and support where you know every, everybody's talking, one another, all hands are on deck, and the left hand knows what the right hand's doing. Um, parents are going to need to be spending time with their children as, as they're in, a, in the care of their um, foster parents. Um, we know that uh, if parents can start reconnecting with their children as soon as the kids go into foster care, um, it's more likely reunification is going to occur. Birth parents show up more if the visits start right away. If they occur within the first 48 hours, the rate of showing up for visits increases dramatically. And parents um, who are connecting with their kids regularly have kids who are showing fewer problems when they're in care, infants and toddlers. Um, the mother's visits are a stronger prediction of unification than are her problems, including substance abuse. Um, we know that visits either in the parent's home or in the foster home are associated with better outcomes than are visits that are held in an agency or another location. Um, birth parents participating in case reviews and other activities are critically important. So frequent visitations are important, but also we need to be prepared that sometimes the parents are not going to be ready for a visit, and we need to have good communication among the principals involved, because it's better to not have a visit on that day than to have a parent who's not ready having a poor quality visit. Um, I'm not saying cancellations are a good thing, but we need to be moving toward a place where we're having more of a um, awareness of what's happening with the baby today, what's happening with the parent today. We have a visit planned. Are we going to be able to do that? And even if visits have gone well, that doesn't assure that successful overnights are going to occur. And Lisa may say a few more words about that. Um, when you use the term co-parenting, birth parents don't believe you because they really don't have the same amount of power as do the others. So it's very important to be bringing them into the picture as soon as possible. 
Um, the next several slides have some language you can be using. I'm going to take care of your child until you can go back home. I know that you're going to miss each other. Asking the parent for advice about the baby who's come into their care. What's her favorite food? What do you do to comfort her? Um, acknowledging the birth parent's contributions to the baby to that point. Um, answering questions about what you're doing with the parent's child while you're together. Um, these are questions that every um, biological parent is going to have at one level or another. And being able to have the birth parent participate in some very important activities, birthdays, holidays, um, uh, medical visits while they're in care. So really starting this dialogue, talking positively to the baby about the parent, um, and, and using every opportunity to keep the parent's spirit alive while they're with you, and then communicating back to the parents as often as possible what's going on. If it's possible, maintaining those connections, those co-parenting connections, even after the baby comes back home again. And, and remembering always, remembering always that the health of the baby is going to rely on the health of the caregiver. You know, I, I often say, when was the last time you yelled at your child? It's when there were stresses in your life. You didn't intend to yell at your child, but you weren't at the top of your game. This is true for all of us. For multi-stressed parents, it's even truer. So one of the best things caseworkers can do to help parents is to help them to kind of get things in order in other aspects of their life so they can feel more grounded and be able to give care and love to their child. Now I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Lisa Negrini, who has a couple of case examples for you. Hello there. That was great, Jamie. Fantastic presentation. Um, really, really great overview. I'm going to give you a couple of case presentations today. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories that will help tie things together. I'm going to tell you about Jesse's case first. So Jesse is a two-year-old little boy. He lives with his maternal grandmother. And he was drug exposed and actually did live with his mom for the first couple of months of his life. Um, his mom and dad had a kind of ongoing uh, in and out relationship with a lot of domestic violence issues, um, lots of drug exposure. So at three months of age, Jesse actually was removed from his mother, um, went into medical foster care because of failure to thrive symptoms, and mom went into a drug rehab program. Jesse stayed in medical foster care for about nine months. Um, after nine months, he did was placed into a regular foster home. So we're seeing some multiple placements happening here with Jesse. Um, at 23 months, so almost a full year later, Jesse went ahead and um, was placed with his maternal grandmother. Now, maternal grandmother was also caring for four of Jesse's siblings, um, all of them ages seven and under, so she had a very chaotic household. So let's take a minute to take a look at how Jesse was doing when he arrived at Grandma's house. Um, he was really small to start out with, some failure to thrive issues, never really caught up to that 50th percentile for height and weight. So when he got to Grandma's, he was still a really picky eater, having a lot of problems around food, and um, often refused to eat. Um, and demanded a bottle and had a, a temper tantrum and cried until he got a bottle. So Grandma usually gave in and gave him a bottle. Um, lots of problems around bedtime. Didn't want to go to sleep. Didn't want to lay down. Um, frequent crying. Um, woke up during the middle of the night multiple times with nightmares and night terrors. He was very difficult to soothe. Couldn't... Um, calm himself down, wouldn't let grandma calm him down, um, really didn't want grandma to touch him, just very, very difficult to comfort and not able to regulate at all. Um, <clears throat> so 